Today's video is brought to you by Squarespace. So recently I did a deep dive into my photo archives, going back like almost 15 years when I first started out doing photography professionally as a full-time job. And what was really interesting is just looking at the EXIF data on some of these images and remembering the camera systems that I was using at the time and also how low the megapixel count was on some of them. But then also just seeing the images and being reminded of how capable those cameras were and still are. And for the past couple of years, I've been shooting mostly digital medium format. And as a result, that's what I've spoke about on this channel. But I have been thinking recently that I want to do a better job of balancing that out and also focusing on some more affordable equipment as well. And that's really what inspired today's video. So today, this video, you know, this isn't like a hype piece or like a way to wax poetic about uh, older sensors being more filmic or point and shoots and all this kind of stuff. Uh, it's more so just a way to look at some of these older tools, even dating back like 20 years ago and see how capable they still are. So today we're gonna to take a trip back through the digital imaging timeline. We're gonna start back in 2004 and I'm gonna share a bunch of images with you from older camera systems, uh, including some of my older work. We'll play around with some of the files and just look at the potential that this still has. But the first camera that I ever started working with was a Pentax K100D, 6.1 megapixels. And then I went to a K10D after that. And I couldn't find any of those original files of mine dating uh, way back to that first camera, but I did own a 6.1 megapixel camera last year for a brief period of time. And this was an Epson, RD1S, so this was a really cool digital rangefinder that Epson, the printer company made uh, back in 04. And it's a very rare camera, so it's not cheap at all. But the reason I wanted to look at these image files is because uh, it used the same sensor in the Pentax, also in the Nikon D100, and probably some other cameras for the, from the same time. Uh, so I have no doubts that you would you know, grab one of those cameras and the files are gonna act very similar to this. This camera doesn't have some like special filmic sensor or something, but I really enjoyed working with these image files. So these first ones here, this is I think from actually my first time out with the camera down at the Brighton uh, seafront. Um, you know, these are edits, final edits that I've done, but I found that uh, they held up actually quite well, but more importantly, they were just like really easy to work with. So for whatever reason, a lot of these older sensors, these lower resolution sensors, I found take to presets uh, quite well. Whereas with like the newer stuff with the GFX, for whatever reason, it just is a lot more difficult for me and seems to take a lot more work to get the images to a point that I'm happy with. So that's actually one of the things I enjoy most about working with these older cameras. And these are all with presets from the classic lab. I'm not like affiliated or anything with them. I just enjoy using them. And it's interesting, I was even speaking with uh, the person who makes these and he kind of commented as well about how, for whatever reason, presets seem to work better with older sensors. Uh, but this one's a good example here. So this is a, a final edit that's done. And I think it's easy to think, you know, newer sensors are so flexible. And if I use something that's older, it's gonna be so limiting. But I think it's, you often forget that even though a camera's 15 or 20 years old, there still is flexibility. It's not like you're baked into this like crazy contrasty, you know, soft look. Like this is a final edit here and this is how it started. It's quite underexposed. So I still, you know, it still gave me room to to tweak and mess around. And obviously, you know, if you open things up like a hundred to a hundred on the shadows, you're gonna get noise and stuff, but oftentimes you aren't doing that aggressive of edits. And these ones I found, you know, were completely flexible enough for my needs using these presets, tweaking colors and stuff. But here's one of the raw files. So when it comes to resolution, we're getting like a 3000 pixel on the long edge image. So this isn't huge, but it might be fine for a lot of people. I think you have to really think like, what do you actually need to do with your photographs? Cause you could still take this, you could probably up res it and print it, you know, at a decent size. We'll play around with a few files from another camera system next, but uh, we'll edit this one quick. So, this was from the Isle, island of Alderney. And we'll use this Portra 400 plus one. This is from the Classic Lab. And I'm just gonna tweak, do this quick just to get you, give you a feel for how these look. But even just with like minimal work here, using that preset and adjusting a few things like 
I actually quite enjoy how that looks as is. For whatever reason, these are very easy to work with. This one I think probably needs a lens profile. So we're gonna go, I think this was a Voigtlander 21 3.5. You know, even retaining highlight detail, there's flexibility. But we'll just go and we'll use this 400 plus one again. Lift these blacks a bit. Again, I would probably spend a little bit more time on this if I were actually editing this for real. But even at that, you know, very, very minimal. I think that has a great look. Like. I was always very happy with how this looks. So 6.1 megapixels, you know, it, it's obviously very low compared to what we're used to nowadays, but you know, if this fit with like the type of work that I do mostly, um, I would be pretty happy using it. I will say though, like I am tempted, obviously the Epson's an expensive camera, but it'd be a lot of fun just to go get like one of the old Pentaxes and you know, it's K mount, you get like a 28 mil 2.8, probably put that together for like 75 pounds and you just have this fun SLR you can walk around with that's gonna give you, you know, image files that are great to edit and still will have a good look. Okay, so next up we're gonna to jump to 2005, 2006. For me, when I moved on from the Pentax, I went to Canon, I started shooting uh, magazine work, uh, outdoor action sports and stuff. So I picked up a Canon 1D Mark II. This was like one of their pro bodies at the time. And this was a really big deal for me and like as good as it gets at the time. And what's funny is when I pulled these images up and I saw the exit data, like completely forgotten that this was an eight megapixel camera and I couldn't believe it just cause again, by today's kind of standards, that seems so low. And I was almost like, how, how is that a pro camera at the time? But it was fine. It's, it was fine and it's still fine. Like these are JPEGs. It's all I could find from this system, probably because on these shoots I would do, we'd shoot thousands of images over, you know, four or five days out in the mountains. But even still, these JPEG files are like 3,500 pixels. We're getting a little bigger, but the look of them as is, you know, it's great. Like in terms of dynamic range, nice detail in the snow. They're nice and punchy. The colors are great. And you could legitimately go and buy this camera nowadays, probably for like 150 pounds, and you could still work with it. You know, if these resolution numbers were good enough for you, then this is a camera system that is obviously still very capable and can produce really nice looking images. It's funny to look back on this stuff, but I also at the same time bought a Canon 5D Classic as I started to get into landscape work a little more seriously. And this camera was obviously a big deal at the time, 12 megapixels, I think it was 12.7, which again, when I was reminded of that, I almost couldn't believe it because this was my like go-to tool for landscape work at the time. And I was doing shows and selling large prints and it was fine, you know, even with like flexibility in terms of like highlight and shadow detail. So for whatever reason, at least, you know, when I think of older cameras, I just remember them being so much more limiting, but you forget how good they actually were and still are. So these are some raw files from the Canon 5D. So now we're jumping up, we're like 40, 400 pixels on the long edge. And you know, honestly, for a lot of people, that might be more than enough. You could print this at a decent size. And as you can see, these images, even straight out of camera look pretty good. And this is the one thing that I remember is whenever I would make tweaks, it was usually just to like, saturation and contrast and tone. It wasn't like trying to, you know, use presets and all sorts of stuff. Even if we just edit this one quick, which is kind of funny to do, because again, I wouldn't really shoot this kind of stuff or with, you know, wide angle lenses and stuff anymore. But even just going back and playing with these files, you know, minimal adjustments, the colors at a camera look nice. And like, there still is flexibility to pull, you know, highlights back. This one, the color's a little crazier, probably because the white balance is off. You know, but even still, dust spots aside, <laughs> has like a really good look out of camera. But this is one of my uh, original images that would have been like a final edit. And I wanted to pull this one up because again, we're 4,400 pixels wide, but let's say we wanted to go and print with one of these 12 megapixel files. So we'll take this into Photoshop here quickly. 
And if we go up to image, image size, let's say we didn't want to upsize this. We want to stay with, within kind of what we have and we want to print this at 300 DPI. This file as is, it's gonna give us like a 14 and a half inch wide print, which is pretty good. I mean, that's not a bad size print, but if we wanted to resample and upsize this, let's say we wanted to go to 24 inch wide at 300 DPI, so we'll use Preserve Details 2.0. We'll let Photoshop upsize that, basically like tripling its size. And if we go into 100%, I'm just gonna do a quick sharpening workflow on this. So I'll just do this uh, high pass layer, which is kind of my go-to. Leave radius around one. So you can see this is with that high pass sharpening on. That's with it off. That's with it back on. And you could go and obviously refine this a little more, but here we have a 12 megapixel file that's been upsized, almost tripled in size and sharpened quite easily, uh, 24 inch wide print. And honestly, I would be happy printing this. I think it would look really nice when everything's said and done. So I wanted to show you that just because for me, it's a good reminder that, you know, it's easy to get caught up with all of these high megapixel counts. You know, we have point shoots coming out that are 40 megapixels and stuff, but just because something is like say 12 megapixels, doesn't mean that it's not going to be uh, more than enough for like a lot of uses, especially when you use uh, some of today's software and you know, if you sharpen properly, you can still get a lot of mileage out of these files. So back to the video in a second, just have to quickly talk about today's sponsor, which is Squarespace. So I've been using Squarespace for a number of years now for my portfolio, but I recently decided to do a complete website refresh. And I've always really loved the templates that they offer. They're nice and clean and professional, but this time I decided to try out a new custom builder that they launched called Blueprint. So Blueprint allows you to build your site from scratch, but it provides you with layout options, color palettes, and font pairings. And then it also gives you control over everything, allowing you to easily do things like change gallery styles, image sizes, add thumbnails, drop in new content blocks, or add professional features for your business like an online shop to sell your work. So check out squarespace.com today, sign up for a free trial, test it out, and when you're ready to launch, you can use my link below to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Okay, so next up, we're gonna jump to 2008. The next camera that I went to from the 5D Classic was the 5D Mark II. And with this, I seriously think we're starting to get into the range where this is something that is still like more than enough for a lot of uses. So 21 megapixels with the 5D Mark II, and you can see this is just an unedited RAW file where like 5,600 pixels on the long edge. So from a resolution standpoint, this is still pretty good. This is gonna give you a lot of flexibility. And just like with the 5D Classic files, you know, the look straight at a camera when it comes to colors and tones with this, you know, it's quite nice. Again, it's funny to look at this stuff because it's so different than what I do nowadays, but even just with like minimal adjustments, I feel like you could get a pretty good look out of this system depending on, you know, what type of work you do. You know, same with this one. This was shot really early morning, so the white balance is all over the place but you could easily tweak and make this look good. And when we look at the detail, like the sharpness and the detail from this is really nice. Uh, even this one, again, straight at a camera, you know, <laughs> brings back a lot of memories of editing these in the past. I probably would have gone way heavier um, back when I was doing landscape photography in terms of saturation and stuff, but just like, I'm actually surprised with minimal adjustments, like how nice this stuff looks as is. You know, same with this one. Still lots of, you know, flexibility with like highlight retention and even shadows. So these are actually quite fun files to work with. Again, even something like that, just playing around quickly with this raw file, that looks pretty decent. So, like I said, I think the 5D Mark II, even though this was 2008, you know, you forget how capable these cameras were and still are. And I think this is a system where like resolution wise, it's still gonna give you a lot of flexibility. You could pick one of these up. When I was doing research for this video, I think I saw one for sale for like 200 pounds here in the UK. And this is gonna give you a, a camera that you could do a lot with. 
Okay, and finally, we're gonna jump to 2015. We're gonna look at a camera that's uh, one of my favorites and it's 42 megapixels, and that is the Sony a7R II. And this is actually a camera that uh, I used for a few of the images that ended up in an American Mile. And it's a camera that I just love, you know, really high resolution, even by today's standards, 42 megapixel. But the files just edited really easy, like the other camera systems that we looked at. And for whatever reason, I could just get a look that I was quite happy with uh, without a ton of work. And they also took the presets well and stuff. So uh, these are some you know, final edits that I did a couple of years ago. This one I actually used in a printing video not too long ago. Uh, this image here ended up in an American Mile. But yeah, from a resolution standpoint, like we're almost 8,000 pixels on the long edge. These are big files and you know, this is uh, the type of image file that's still gonna be enough for a really, really long time for a lot of uses. This was also in an American Mile and same with this one. So I just l always have loved this camera. These images were all, I think, with uh, adapted contact size glass, one of the beauties of working with a mirrorless like that and having IBIS. But if we go to some raw files, so this one here was probably with that contact glass as well. It looks like it has a, got some crazy distortion going on. But just in terms of how easy, easy these edit, we'll go and we'll do this quickly, but we'll use this Portra 400 plus one preset. Um, try and get rid of some of this vignetting a little bit. But even just with like minimal tweaks, you know, playing around with the shadows and the contrast, you know, even something like that with that initial preset, I do a little bit more work to this, but yeah, when I dove back in and started playing with these files again, I was just kind of reminded of how much I actually liked working with them and how easy they were to work with. So same with this one, we'll use this 400 plus one again. Just do this quickly. You know, even something like that, really, really quick. You know, I love, I love the look of that. I, it's funny, working with this stuff, I'm just like, I have no need for this camera right now because I have a GFX, but it brings back, you know, some good memories and it like tempts me to want to get another, uh, even though I don't need one. And then just one more here. You're getting the point though. And this now, you know, like the other camera systems edited well, they still gave you flexibility, but this is still a sensor and a camera that honestly probably stacks up against a lot of what's available nowadays. This is bringing you to that point with flexibility where you just have like super clean shadows, a lot of highlight retention and flexibility there. So really fun camera. Obviously this one is the most expensive of the bunch, but even still, um, I saw one of these when I was putting this video together here in the UK used for like 699. So quite a bit more, you know, it's not a 200 pound, Canon 5D Mark II, but um, you know, in comparison to like a brand new high resolution camera, 699 is pretty good. And uh, yeah, this would be like, if I didn't have the GFX and I just wanted a digital setup, honestly, I'd be so tempted to go and get this one because I think it's still, you know, very, very capable and just a fun one to work with. So yeah, overall, really fun to jump back and look at this older work. And like I said, just a good reminder about you know, how capable these tools still are. And I think what's really cool is like the options are endless. We looked at some specific cameras today, but you go to when any of those were released and there's obviously a whole bunch of other models from different brands available as well that are probably just as good. So um, yeah, obviously the downside with any of this older tech is the potential for like reliability issues. I think that kind of goes without saying. So it's gonna come down to, I guess, the type of work that you do. For me personally, I would be completely fine going and buying something like the Sony a7R II and using that. But obviously if you were doing like some important client work, you probably wouldn't wanna go and buy like a 15 year old 5D Mark II. But again, I think that kind of just goes without saying. So yeah, this was a fun one to do. Like I said, newer tech, I think we're really spoiled. It's amazing how many options we have nowadays. And if you can justify it or you wanna spend the money, you know, there's some really cool stuff out there to shoot with. But uh, also, I think just looking at this is a good reminder that 
you know, the tools we've had access to for a really long time now are still completely capable. And I don't think there's any reason why you couldn't buy one of these cameras we looked at today and go and shoot and make a body of work with it. So anyways, um, hope you enjoyed this one and that's it for now. Thanks for watching. Talk to you soon.